Let's now have our first conversation for the day looking at the global crude oil market, uh, a high commodity price environment over the last quarter, coupled with operators remaining disciplined with their uh, spending. This has resulted in massive profits for major oil producers. Despite the OPEC Plus recent decision to increase production for September by only 100,000 barrels per day, crude oil prices fell to $92 per day uh, per barrel, showing marginal easing of uh, fundamentals and probably a change of perception in the market. Prices have been actually uh, declined on a weakening market sentiment amid growing concerns, of course, uh, over a sharp economic slowdown and the resulting potential impact on global oil demand. The price decline was triggered by data reports by the Energy um, Information Administration showing weak U.S. seasonal demand for gasoline that had fallen to 2020 levels. However, market backwardization slightly strengthening despite falling uh, month front, front month contract. Well, let's talk more about this and joining me via Zoom to look at all of these developments in the oil market is a doctor, uh, Ayodele Oni. He's an energy lawyer and, of course, an analyst uh, of the entire space. Thank you so much. It's good to have you start the week on Business Nigeria uh, today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, let's start much. with this flip-flop we've been seeing in the market. Uh, we were so optimistic at the time that the market will stay positive. Talking about the crude oil market and what will be uh, the uh, what's it called uh, a barrel of oil will be sold at. But at the moment, we see a sharp decline. Uh, take us through what could be responsible for this. For a long time, we've stayed with the Russian and Ukraine crisis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know that oil prices are volatile, um, and it's not only availability and uh, market forces, generally speaking, uh, that affect the price. Um, issues such as information, suspicion, um, people believe that um, demand won't be what it currently is and has actually been dropping, and the fact that um, a lot of people believe that there may be a recession. So all of these can cost it. And at times, you would have a glut because OPEC, had consistently increased um, quotas and output. Although, of course, many of these countries, including Nigeria, have failed to meet their um, quotas. So I think all of these factors, like any rumor does affect the market, you know, um, suspicion, and, it, and even what you have av available, and the demand, market forces itself, too, will generally affect. So it's a combination of more than one issue that is affecting um, the market and the decline we, we now see. And, you know, as this, um, prices will only increase up onto a point and then they begin to go down. I mean, it's not impossible then that it then begins to go back up if, those, if, that, if the suspicion you see, if, what, if the expectation of the market isn't exactly what it turns out to be. Mm. It's a good start. Uh, looking at the roller coaster ride here, it was as low as twenty-one dollars per barrel at a particular time during COVID. Uh, let's take uh, let's take back uh, look back at that. And at the peak of the Russia and Ukraine crisis, about one hundred and thirty-nine dollars to a barrel. Now, would you say that countries or all producing countries have actually taken advantage of this boom that they just came up uh, in recent times? Not looking at countries like Nigeria, we don't we find. Yes, a lot of countries have been smiling to the bank. I mean, that, that's what, um, that's, the, that's the information I have. You know, because um, cost of production is, is usually at a particular percentage or is a percentage of your total um, income. So if prices go up, costs do not necessarily go up. So there's been that um, excess profit for countries who sell, and those who can meet their quota. Nigeria hasn't exactly benefited as much as it should for two reasons. Like, you know, one, we don't refine, two, we've not been able to meet that quota. Because if you sell a base resource like fruit, and then have to buy back refined products, which is more expensive, 
then at the end of the day, your balance of trade and balance of trade payment may be a deficit or may be at a deficit. So yes, countries have benefited from it. Countries like countries like Saudi, uh, amongst others, have benefited from this. Mm. Uh, let's now look at OPEC. Uh, at all meetings, they've continued to increase output. Let's now come down to a country like Nigeria that has not been able to meet up with this quarter. Uh, what does this mean for us? And do you see light at the end of the tunnel? We see a lot of moves aimed at addressing this lingering issue, of course, of, uh, of vandalism, all theft, uh, which has almost become the order of the day in, in some regions in Nigeria. Yes. Oh, yes, there's a lot being done, even by the exploration and production companies. Um, and if I may say, um, I've had to advise on a number of, um, of alternatives to moving crude from point of production to the terminal, to the export terminal, because um, the private sector isn't necessarily waiting for government. But government is doing a lot for this part. And you might have seen it in the press, a number of uh, uh, points where people carry on bunkering, um, fruit theft, and illegal refineries. A number of those have been um, clamped down. Some of them even destroyed. So government is doing a lot. And government is also currently working with the host communities. You know, the PIA does a good job of ensuring that the host communities have the stake. They have skin in the game um, by, also, by getting some of the revenue and also ensuring that if they do get that revenue or if they are entitled to that revenue, then they can safeguard the infrastructure around there. So it, it's a two-pronged approach. Government is doing its bit and the private sector is looking at alternatives. So I think in the very, very soon, um, production should increase. We should ramp up production substantially, or, or, or I would say moderately, more than substantially, moderately, because it's also because there's been underinvestment for a, for a while, because of the uncertainty around the legal regime. You know, for a long time, we're talking about the Petroleum Industry Bill that has now become the Petroleum Industry Act. You know, and one thing about the investors is that they're not going to invest in an uncertain regime because they need to be sure of how they would recover their cost, risk capital. You don't want to invest and you're not sure about cost recovery, how you're going to make profit. So I think that has slowed us down in terms of investment. And secondly, issues around food theft which government is working on, and the private sector too is working around um, alternatives. I, I can't say much more because I've been involved in a number of these transactions, but, but the private sector is doing quite a bit, and we'll see successes very shortly. And now, then we, when Nigeria I started can uh, with reporting on the show today, talking about news reports, uh, we took a story uh, for Nigeria losing about 891 billion naira now to gas flaring. For as long as uh, God knows when, I've been hearing lots of deadlines being set to stop gas flaring. But as we speak today, we're still losing this whooping sum of 891 billion naira to gas flaring. Uh, what is your reaction to this as a professional and an expert in the industry? Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I'll, I'll take, you, take us a bit back into history. You know, um, when you more often than not, when you um, produce oil, you would have gas. And many people didn't need gas. In fact, it was said historically that you were better off getting water than getting gas. So many people were looking for oil, not looking for gas, particularly in a country like Nigeria, where you had low demand. The commercial arrangement was very poor. Um, very few people needed gas, say for Nepa. And at that time, Nepa barely paid even the cost. Imagine you produce something for one naira, and government forces you to sell it for 50 kobo. No, that business is not sustainable. So over time, we didn't have sufficient infrastructure for gas, so uh, for gas utilization, for, for gas processing, you know. So a lot of people will flare gas and waste it. So, but over time, that has improved. So I think it's not about having the stick. It should, it's a stick and carrot approach. Government, um, until very recently, where that has gone quiet, and that's where consistency of policy and seeing things through. There's a gas commercialization program that I, I was advising one of one or two of the bidders on that. My, my firm was I'm advising one or two of the bidders on that. And it suddenly went quiet at some point. So government's been doing a lot to encourage gas utilization. As long as you don't have gas utilization or gas export, those are the two options, um, you, you will have to flare the gas because you gas storage is 
almost, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's very, very expensive. So rather than store, they would flare. Flare gas means just releasing it to the atmosphere because you do not need it, whether in the process of production and all of those. So government, one, a lot is happening around infrastructure. Government is doing that. There's the AKK and a number of those projects, Oban 3 and a number of those projects, and the private sector. If government can see through some of these policies, particularly that policy that allows private companies to take gas um, at flare points and then utilize them for certain projects, particularly midstream and downstream projects, uh, it, it, we, we will see that reduced drastically. And, and, and I see your concern. Because we're wasting a lot of money. When you waste, when you flare gas, you waste money. You waste what you could have been, what could have been used to, for productive activities to employ more people, to create new industries, you know, to generate more income for the country. You understand? See what's happening in the world with respect to the war, um, Ukraine and um, Russia. We can benefit more by selling more gas. But you know, more often than not, you need infrastructure. And you need long-term contracts, even if you wanted to do LNG. The LNG just doesn't appear. You need to build your trains. You need to build um, uh, gasification plants. You need to build uh, liquefaction plants, rather, and regasification plants. You need a lot. You need your shipping arrangements. So, I mean, uh, for, for a long time, and not this administration, previous administrations could have done much more, you know, in terms of um, infrastructure backbone, in terms of improving our position with respect to LNG supply internationally. So it's a bad situation that we are losing that much and flaring gas. Well, government has a number of programs. We just need to ensure that government doesn't only speak or government doesn't only talk or issue brilliant policies, but also implement them, like the gas commercialization, gas flare commercialization program and, and the gas penetration program that government has been working on. If all of those are put in place and are effected or implemented as they should, we should see that drop drastically. But I must also point out that over a period of time, in the last 10, 20 years, gas flaring has reduced drastically. When you speak about this amount, it would have been times four, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Those are my thoughts. Uh, you, you identified in, in your first submission talking about the potential recession. Of course, uh, U.S. Uh, job market, looking at what's uh, playing out, there have been some new jobs actually being generated uh, because of a dr little drop in energy costs and all of that. I, I, I heard this morning that they're saving about 10 bucks or so, uh, getting a liter, a gallon of fuel over there. But let's now look at all of these realities, COVID-19, lockdowns, a looming recession, and other issues affecting the global market. Uh, uh, tell me the direct implication on the price of crude as we move on. Uh, it's just a projection, of course, but let's just look at it because I was looking that we'll stay far above a hundred dollar per barrel almost all through the year. I, I think I think um, it would it would oscillate around that amount. Um, it would be between what we have now. I doubt that it would drop much um, much lower, and I think it will pick up at some point unless things change. I mean, there's some new information around the world. Maybe it's ending. And there's a, oh, there's a glut in the market, but um, because many countries can't even meet their quota, it's unlikely that there will be a glut anytime soon, you know, unless, of course, there is a recession and that means that um, productive activity slow down or there's some reason. Otherwise, I, I don't think it will drop substantially. I think it may even pick up. I think it will oscillate around this until the war ends. Maybe even, yeah, until there are rumors that the war will end or until the war actually ends. That's what I project. That's what I see. Uh, let's wrap up on this very interesting note. Uh, NNPC, now a limited liability company, and a lot of expectations from that end, particularly being a more profitable company. Yes, of course, that is the major aim. Profitable and, of course, accountable to 200 million Nigerians. That is what government intends to achieve. Do you think that with this new uh, format, or how the NNPC will be run, do you think it will be as productive compared to maybe the likes of Saudi Aramco and all of that? Okay, yes. Um, I think if we reduce political influence, I mean, if you look at the board, they seem to consist mainly of politicians. If we, if we reduce political influence, have more expert, um, independent directors, those sort of people, yes, we stand a really good chance. Also because government, it would no longer be an appendix of government. It would only be 
a company where government owns shares at the moment. I mean, the plan is to ultimately sell some of the shares to, to the public. Uh, yeah, it, it should work. So issues such as the many of those problems they had raising finance, um, the toga of being a political or uh, a government um, appendix will be off. So issues such as World Bank negative pledge, Federation account issues, like I had, I think it was this morning that the state governments were having issues with NNPC. Well, NNPC no longer will be <laughs> dropping any money at FAC. That's my understanding. Because if it's a company on that, on that camera, all you would do would be to give dividends. You know, and they can have a different dividend, dividend policy, which could be quarterly, half yearly. I'm not sure what their dividend policy will be. You know, all they would do now is to pay dividends to the owners, which is the federal government, and then they do whatever they want with it online, unlike the monthly thing that was done before. So I think it can be properly run. Um, they stand a much better chance now than it was, but there's still more that needs to be done. Uh, Dr. Tony, uh, on a final note, uh, we are being assured that um, the Portacot refinery will begin refining maybe about 65,000 barrels per day uh, by the first quarter of 2023. Uh, I guess that's what we've been told by the NNPC. But what is your assessment of that rehabilitation work? I like that word, rehabilitation. It's different from the former turnaround maintenance that we used to have. Okay, interestingly, um, 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 my colleagues and I in, in the firm have been advising on one, two of um, those refineries. And I see that government in terms of the financing. And I see that government is doing quite a bit, actually, to ensure that this does happen. It's a much more transparent process. That's what I see. Um, I can't go into more details like, because I am, I, I am advising on that. I'm not the Potter Court now. I'm Warrior and Kaduna. Um, so I see, I see a lot of um, activity around that. I see a lot of interest, and I see that government wants to do things right. I think it's, uh, the Potter Court is closer in terms of reaching where it should. So I think that, that that's correct. I think what you hear is right, and I think government does intend to do things differently from what it used to be to ensure that we succeed this time around, so that we don't export food and have to always buy finished products and, and then have a negative um, balance of trade and payment. So yes, we're closer to, um, to, to, to success than we ever were. All right, it's a good way to leave it there. Dr. Ayodele Oni there uh, speaking to us about the crude oil market and of course expectations uh, moving on. He's an energy analyst. And, uh, of course, a lawyer, energy lawyer. Thank you so much for spending your Monday afternoon with us. We appreciate this. I do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your week, too.